Um, we're gonna. We're just about to start here, so. Um, oh, good. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Mircea Montano. I'm the project associate, program associate at the History and Public Policy Program and Cold War International History Project. I want to welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson Center. For those of you who are not familiar with the center, um, the Wilson Center is the nation's official living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, it is a nonpartisan institute for advanced study and a neutral forum for open, serious, and informed dialogue. It brings preeminent thinkers to Washington for extended periods of time to interact with policymakers through a large number of programs and projects. The center seeks to separate the important from the inconsequential and to take a historical and broad perspective on the issues. At the Woodrow Wilson Center, the Cold War International History Project, which is part of the History and Public Policy Program, uh, supports the full and prompt release of historical materials by governments on all sides of the Cold War and seeks to accelerate the process of integrating new sources, materials, and perspectives from the former communist bloc with the historiography of the Cold War. It also seeks to transcend barriers of language, geography, and regional specialty to create new links among scholars interested in Cold War history. Among the activities undertaken by the project, promote the same are the periodic bulletin and other publications, most of which are actually outside, available for free or available on uh, our website, um, as well as the project's virtual archive, the largest collection of declassified communist archival documents available online in translation, international scholarly meetings, conferences, and seminars. Um, today we're hosting just such a seminar uh, on um, a new publication just uh, just out by John Prados. Um, the book is actually available also for sale outside. I'm mean, just briefly introduce the speakers today. Uh, John Prados is a longtime friend of the project, um, and um, he's a senior fellow at the George Washington University's National Security uh, Archive, where he focuses on presidential power, international relations, intelligence, and military affairs. He holds a PhD from Columbia University and leads the National Security Archives Vietnam and Iraq Documentation Project. He is the author or editor of uh, 16 books, and 17 as of last week, um, including most recently Vietnam, The History of an Unwinnable War, 1945-1975, which is the book we're discussing today. Uh, also on the panel, Dr. Thomas Hughes, President Emeritus of Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, having served as president from 1971 to 1985. He's also a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and the American Academy of Diplomacy. He served as the director of the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the Department of State from 63 to 69. Um, joining us today as well is uh, Dr. Larry Berman, Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Davis and director of the UC, um, uh, UC Washington program. He is the author of several books on the Vietnam War, including Planning a Tragedy, Lyndon Johnson's War, and most recently, Perfect Spy, uh, The Extraordinary Double Life of, of Pham Xuan An, Time Re uh, Magazine reporter and Vietnamese communist agent. He is a former Woodrow Wilson Center fellow uh, and recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and Bernard Lecture Prizes. Um, we're gonna, um, gonna let the author speak for about 30 minutes or so, maybe a little bit more, um, followed by Dr. Hughes and Dr. Berman, and then we're gonna open it up to some uh, question and answers. So, John, thank you. Okay, well, actually, I think I will be much briefer than that. Last one of these like that. sessions that I did, we practically didn't get to the questions because we took so much time palavering. So uh, I want to make sure that doesn't happen here. So I'm actually going to pre present a shorter set of remarks than I had originally intended, starting here. Um, 45 years ago today, Lyndon Baines Johnson was President of the United States, and he gave a press conference. At that press conference, he said this was... June the 2nd, 1964, about eight weeks before the Tonkin Gulf incidents, he said that he was aware of no United States plans to extend the Vietnam War to North Vietnam. 
at the height of the American program of uh, covert pressures against Hanoi that was going on at that moment. And, of course, he reaffirmed the United States' commitment to fight in the defense of South Vietnam. This was uh, yet another illustration of uh, uh, how and where the United States got into the Vietnam War. And um, I want to start there. I want to start with the idea of commitment. The uh, process by which the United States got into Vietnam. But before I go there, let me just put out uh, a little bit about this book, since that's what we're supposed to be talking about. Um, there have been a lot of uh, myths that have grown up around the Vietnam War and uh, the general subject of Vietnam. And I think a lot of them have to do with what I call in here the atomization of the way we think about it. People who write about Vietnam often uh, look at a piece of the dinosaur and generalize to the whole thing. We have analyses of the politics of Vietnam that then generalize to the whole war. We have analyses of individual battles that then generalize to the whole war. We have uh, analyses of the press coverage of the war, of the anti-war movement, of the uh, decisions of presidents, and uh, in each case, uh, analysts jump from their little piece of the dinosaur to talk about the whole thing. And I think that kind of atomization distorts what we need to understand about the Vietnam War. So the point of departure for this book was to try and uh, step back from that put all the pieces together, which of course resulted in the large volume that you see before you because there was a lot of ground to cover and there were a lot of relevant things that needed to be fit in there. So this book contains an enormous amount of material. It talks about uh, uh, the presidents and it talks about the processes of decision making. It talks about the institutional factors. It talks about the uh, uh, preparation of the U.S. military and its strategy and tactics and, in fact, how the forces were manned through the Vietnam War. Talks about uh, the other side. Talks about the South Vietnamese and South Vietnamese politics. And a piece, by the way, that's often uh, ignored in analyses of Vietnam. Uh, talks about the battles and the leaders and all that kind of stuff. So there's a huge amount of material, but as I said at the beginning, where I want to start and go today is to focus on this idea of commitment. The United States, uh, unlike our interests in Europe, let's say, with uh, an extended set of treaty commitments and a historical relationship that goes back for decades and centuries, in Southeast Asia we did not have that kind of a, uh, a background, that kind of baggage going into the Vietnam situation. In the Vietnam situation, we did not have sunk interests. We did not have uh, uh, extended uh, relationships with local leaders. Um, in fact, what we had was really a sort of a tabula rasa. It was our uh, option to do whatever we wanted to do about Southeast Asia starting in 1945, starting at the end of World War II. And that's where we start this book because really I see the process of the United States becoming involved in Vietnam as a continuum that goes back to uh, the American situation at the end of World War II and goes through the French colonial period and the French War, then into what became known as the American War. The process, I think, can be conceptualized very nicely as, uh, uh, if you think of an airplane. Airplane takes off from a runway, takes to the air, it has a full load of gas, it has 360 degrees of vector. It can fly anywhere. 
the United States policy towards Southeast Asia in 1945 was in that kind of a situation. As we moved forward through the years and made a series of decisions, at first decisions that uh, uh, went against the avoidance of war in Southeast Asia, and then a series of decisions about prosecuting a war, the envelope, the flight envelope of our aircraft, of American policy in Southeast Asia, progressively narrowed until the point where the situational factors that obtained in the Vietnam conflict itself began to uh, affect and ultimately to dominate uh, uh, the, the course of the war as well as the process of American decision making and uh, to a great degree as well uh, of American politics. Uh, in terms of periodization, let me say this. In 1945, the easiest thing in the world would have been to avoid a war in Indochina, an American war in Indochina, because all that was required at that time was to uh, prevent French military forces from returning to the Far East at the end of World War II. All merchant shipping at that time, we're talking about World War II here, was controlled by an inter-allied board on which the United States uh, exercised dominant influence, and it was up to that board to assign ships to carry French troops to the Far East. Uh, allied uh, powers, and this is independent of the whole argument about whether FDR favored independence for Vietnam or did not, and at what point in this whole process he stepped back from doing that. Small instrumental decisions and choices like these set up a lot of things that happened in the Vietnam situation and in the narrowing, that progressive narrowing of the uh, flight envelope of this American policy aircraft. From 1945 to 1950, during the, the period in which the French War uh, began and escalated, the United States could have stood aside. We let the French uh, talk us into looking at the Vietnamese situation in a Cold War context, as this contest of uh, communist enemies against democratic friends. From 1950 to 1954, we were actually and actively supporting the French in their war in Indochina, and uh, of which we have veterans here, I might add. And uh, the situation progressively narrowed. I'm going to come back to, circle back to the period 1954-1955 because I think this was a moment when key things happened. But let me go past that. Um, in the period after the French lost at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the uh, new South Vietnamese government of Ngo Dinh Diem uh, tried to implant itself in the country, the United States advanced to a new level of commitment. And in the early 1960s, when there was a change of administrations in the United States, uh, again affording the new president an opportunity to change direction in U.S. policy, Vietnam was conceived of by John Kennedy as uh, a convenience, uh, a place where he could demonstrate uh, uh, loyalty mm -hmm. and uh, uh, his Cold War uh, commitment, and even use Vietnam as a kind of a combat laboratory for the counterinsurgency tactics that uh, he felt the United States needed to adapt itself uh, to cope with. Uh, that brings us to Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and by the time of Johnson, who made the major decisions about committing troops and about actually prosecuting an American war, that's the point where it becomes impossible anymore to avoid the war situation. And at that point, 
situational factors begin to dominate. Now, I present an argument in the book about how those situational factors, in fact, drove uh, the Vietnam conflict, how uh, American military means were not suited to the kind of conflict that they were facing. It took us a certain amount of time to rejigger our forces for optimal uh, effect in the Vietnamese War. During that period of time, the political problem of Vietnam uh, mushroomed in the United States, while simultaneously the diplomatic problems the United States faced internationally because it was prosecuting a war in Vietnam increased. And the political support from the South Vietnamese government that would have been necessary to cap the bottle, as it were, in Vietnam failed to materialize, leading to a further uh, deterioration of the situation and a succession of events like this. I argued that Johnson went through a process like this, that Nixon uh, tried to break out of the uh, confines of this uh, policy envelope by what I call Nixon shocks, um, and that because the uh, political sensitivity of the situation had risen to the point that it had, and because the military forces of the United States were in the situation that they were in, in which the United States had to withdraw forces in order to maintain some kind of freedom of action politically and diplomatically in the Vietnam situation, ultimately these things played <coughs> against us. So, uh, you can look at the concluding chapter of that book to find a much more uh, fine-tuned and articulated uh, sense of what I'm trying to convey right here. But um, I want to make the point about Eisenhower and Ziem and the early period do this little circle back routine before I hand it over to my colleagues here. Um, in the Pentagon Papers, that notorious document of the Vietnam era, right up front, in the very uh, forward that was written by Leslie Gelb, who was actually the project director who uh, uh, assembled the Pentagon Papers, he makes the argument, uh, and this was an argument that was all over the place at the time, that uh, the major American problem was a lack of leverage, that the United States lacked leverage in the Vietnam situation, and thus we were not, we, the, thus the Vietnam situation became, in fact, intractable for us, and we were not able to handle it. And that was a major part of Gelb's analysis for why the United States was in the mess that it was in in Vietnam. Well, I think if you analyze uh, the history, and I've done this here, um, you can identify among these various points of decision where American presidents could have chosen to avoid war and did not do so, you can identify a moment, a specific moment, where in fact the United States gave up that leverage. And that moment happened in the spring of 1955 in Saigon. And it revolved around a Vietnamese political crisis uh, and the uh, effort by uh, Vietnamese leader Nguyen Dinh Diem to solidify his control over the country. And a series of efforts within the United States government uh, I shouldn't say a series of efforts, I should say a series of maneuvers within the United States government, basically over who was going to be in charge, who was going to take the lead on this policy in South Vietnam, and uh, thus who was going to be the controlling influence on American policy. The president at that time, Dwight D. Eisenhower, was the one who created this situation because... Uh, going back to the French, my argument is that Dien Bien Phu was a formative event and in fact in many ways sort of laid down a kind of a, a DNA 
that determined a great number of things that happened subsequently in the Vietnam War. And in this particular case, what it did was Eisenhower was guilty, felt guilty, that his project to sustain the French in the face of the challenge that they had had at Dien Bien Phu had failed, left him in a situation of uh, wanting to move forward, wanting to square the circle about nationalism and anti-communism in Southeast Asia, and he made promises in a letter to Nguyen Dinh Diem that was sent in October of 1954. And much like George W. Bush in uh, Iraq in 2006, he gave the Vietnamese a letter that made promises and had benchmarks. And the promise was that the United States was going to support South Vietnam, and the benchmarks were that the South Vietnamese, this was conditional on, his condition was that the South Vietnamese government was going to undertake reforms and uh, uh, create a more democratic, sustainable system. Uh, fast forward to the spring of 1955, Ziem, over a series of months of political maneuvers, has uh, progressively outflanked different power centers in the South Vietnamese polity, uh, and he gets to the point where the big remaining obstacle is uh, political religious sects in the country, uh, along with elements, disaffected elements, uh, of, among intelligentsia and the Vietnamese military. And there's a struggle in Saigon and a crisis. Uh, the American ambassador at that time was uh, President Eisenhower's good friend from World War II and wartime colleague, an Army general named J. Lawton Collins, who had in fact been chief of staff of the United States Army and was uh, selected by Eisenhower to be his personal representative in South Vietnam. Now, I'm not going to uh, burden you with all the details of what happened in this set of maneuvers, but I will just make the point that Collins, on the, uh, in, in place, in the situation, Collins first uh, uh, agreed with his own advisors that Ziem had potential and possibilities. He watched the situation evolve over a period of several months. He decided that that first idea of his had been wrong. He then recommended to Eisenhower that the United States change its policy and dump Ziem. Um, meanwhile, other people in the United States government uh, the head of the CIA, Alan Dulles, the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, uh, one of uh, the CIA's local representatives in Saigon, uh, Edward Lansdale, uh, and various allies of all of these people uh, worked back and forth behind the scenes and convinced Eisenhower, rather than accepting Collins's policy, to uh, reject it. Um, there were a whole series of shenanigans involved in this, and you'll enjoy the details, I think. Um, but the bottom line of it is that all of the Vietnamese leaders who would be in key positions in Saigon from 1955 through 1975 were talking about Nguyen Khan, we're talking about Zhuang Van Min, we're talking about Nguyen Van Tu, we're talking about Nguyen Cao Ki. All of them were there in Saigon in 1955 to witness the United States give up its benchmarks and give away uh, its ability actually to uh, exert control in a Vietnamese context. And I think that Gelb's analysis uh, and uh, treatment of leverage, the leverage question, to the extent that uh, it is a correct one, and I think there's a lot to it, uh, traces right to this point where the United States, in effect, crippled its own 
uh, uh, effort. Now, there may have been good reasons and solid uh, understanding on among many of the characters involved in these situations, but uh, the ultimate effect of what happened during those days in Saigon in 1955 was hugely damaging to the American enterprise as a whole in Vietnam. And this is an example of how this process of uh, the diminishing envelope of U.S. policy in Vietnam uh, wound its way through to where we ended up uh, losing the war, leaving Vietnam through the Paris Agreement in early 1973, and ultimately losing the war uh, completely in 1975 when Hanoi marched into Saigon. I'm going to stop there and hand it over to my colleagues. Thank you, John. Um, Dr. Hughes? Uh, John Prados, is, is this on? Yes. Uh, Vietnam is an encyclopedic 600-page book and obviously a tour de force, a uh, prodigious accomplishment. It's what Wagner used to call a gesamt Kunstwerk, a total composite work of art. Uh, at one point, John himself worries that any additions would make it unwieldy. It's already so overwhelming there's a danger that once you put it down, it's nearly impossible to pick it up. But nevertheless, I have unbounded admiration for the author and for all the labor that's gone into this production. And I'm confident that it will be an invaluable resource for all of those who do pick it up. Uh, let me therefore begin by highlighting certain themes that I consider praiseworthy in the book. Uh, mentioned a few missing situational factors that I wished had been in the book, and later venture some minor corrections and one major complaint. It's my impression that the book richly enhances an appreciation of the Nixon administration, and that part of it I'll uh, simply omit and hope that Larry Berman will tell us more about that, because my own uh, personal years of experience were in Washington from 61 to 69, and in INR during that entire period. So I'll concentrate only on the first half of the book the, and limit my comments to Washington more or less and the Kennedy-Johnson years. To begin with, I especially like John's notion of a unified theory approach uh, to overcome what he correctly calls uh, atomization. I applaud what he's achieved in pursuing that objective. I liked his emphasis on the goals of the Vietnamese flowing in sync with the global tide of decolonialization, while the U.S. endeavor itself came up against it. This is ironic, of course. Kennedy, Johnson, Rusk, and Rostow all convinced themselves that they were anti-colonial, anti-imperialist. By definition, we couldn't be a colonial power. Rusk somewhat perversely even taunted George Ball uh, and his, quote, white European colleagues as believing that brown and yellow Asians did not deserve the security protection that we were then giving Western Europe. And in defending U.S. policy in Vietnam, Rusk even went so far as to link it to the civil rights movement here at home. I like John's emphasis on the vast canvas of domestic politics and regret only that he does not give more uh, attention uh, to the demagogic roles that most prominent Republicans played in the 1960s throughout both Democratic administrations. I'm thinking not only of right-wingers like Goldwater, Nixon, and Nolan, and Dirksen, and so forth, but also of Eisenhower, the sage of Gettysburg, who was singularly unhelpful time after time when Democratic President sought his advice on Vietnam, when JFK and LBJ uh, talked to him on the phone or sent emissaries like McCohen or Goodpaster up to Gettysburg. To see him seeking counsel, Eisenhower always talked dominoes and always urged escalation. I like John's emphasis on the persistent overlay of Cold War ideology as a regular impediment to official understanding of the dynamics of Southeast Asia. The Munich analogy played a pervasive role in the mindsets of the policymakers, the media, and the public alike uh, in the 1960s. I've always thought that the grip of Munich on Dean Rusk and Walt Rasta was one of the lingering misfortunes left over from their period in Oxford as Rhodes Scholars during Hitler's rise to power in the 30s. Incidentally, this syndrome uh, was not a universal Rhodes Scholar malady. Vietnam pitted many of them against one another in Washington in the 60s. Fulbright, Rusk, Katzenbach, Rostow, McNaughton, Cleveland, McGee, and Carver, just to mention a few. Uh, 
a comparative account of the behavior on Vietnam of office-holding Rhodes Scholars might be instructive about the continuity of the uh, Munich analogy. Parenthetically, I must confess that I found John's frequent reaching ahead 30 years and using Iraq as a projection of Vietnam uh, rather distracting. Having himself exposed the dangers of historical analogies, Iraq seemed intrusive and somewhat forced to me. Perhaps the publishers uh, like Iraq as a useful marketing device. I like John's emphasis on Kennedy's double fixation on counterinsurgency and covert operations. From the presidents on down, the enthusiasm was widespread in the JFK years for Green Beret activism and supposedly deniable undercover stealth. I also find convincing John's skeptical conclusion on page 78 to 82 about Kennedy's counterfactual so-called withdraw uh, withdrawal decision on Vietnam. I also like John's continued perplexity regarding LBJ. His description of Johnson's ambiguous reactions to George Ball's Vietnam memos rings true, and I too would credit LBJ with taking Ball more seriously than many others do. A single sentence on page 159 tells us that Walt Rostow succeeded Mac Bundy. This also remains one of the LBJ mysteries. Bill Moyers doubts that LBJ had really focused on Rostow's role over the previous six years. Who pushed for him for the Bundy job? Rusk, perhaps, but that would be another irony. In 1961, Rusk firmly refused to have Rostow in the State Department. By 1967 to 1968, they, the two of them were left in tandem as the leading residual hawks. John also appropriately points to the enduring mystery of, of LBJ's role and attitudes during the 1968 election, torpedoing the Humphrey Peace Plank of the Democratic Convention, playing footsie with Nixon all through the campaign, swallowing the Chenault affair, which if disclosed might have won the election for Humphrey. All of these moves keep alive the concern that many Democrats at the time, for Vietnam reasons, uh, actually thought LBJ preferred Nixon over Humphrey the Democratic nominee. When confronted with its size and scope, some reviewers will probably say this book is the last word on the subject, but John himself probably would agree it isn't the last word. Having given you some positive endorsements, let me mention five of what John calls situational factors, which uh, I occurred to me were missing and which I think deserve a place in any uh, Vietnam story that's this long. Uh, considering the book's potential long life, in fact, they might even be candidates for inclusion in a second edition. One, hubris was a phenomenon that the leading Washington actors on Vietnam carried over from the Cuba Missile Crisis of 1962. JFK's success in Cuba, often achieved in spite of his advisors, nevertheless gave the whole group around the president an enhanced collective reputation and the false confidence that came with it compared to facing down the mighty Soviet Union and avoiding a nuclear war. Vietnam seemed a small, doable conflict. The public reputations of Kennedy's advisors, especially the veterans of the XCOM and the Cuba Missile Crisis, tended to help immunize them from criticism for a while, uh, as they, the same people, made Vietnam recommendations in 1965. Two, Vietnam was, in a sense, our first Catholic war. For various reasons, Americans of Irish Catholic, Italian Catholic, German Catholic extraction had mixed feelings about World War I and even World War II. By contrast, Vietnam was a war in support of a Catholic regime in Saigon and of hundreds of thousands of Catholics who'd fled south. The first American Catholic president was supported by a co-religionist caste, including the CIA director, most of the generals and activists who founded the American Friends of Vietnam, Cardinal Spellman of New York, a self-appointed vicar of Vietnam, all taking their place in the midst of an active and persistent anti-communism of the Catholic Church in America, both nationally and locally. I don't want to overstate this, but it's been such a taboo subject for so long that it's worth a paragraph or two in any Vietnam War encyclopedia. Three, for most of the Kennedy-Johnson years, there was a silent behind-the-scenes contest among aspirant secretaries of state as early as 1962, many assumed Rusk would be leaving, one way or the other. From time to time, the plausible successors, at least in their own eyes, included Fulbright, Bundy, McNamara, McCone, Bowles, Ball, Katzenbach, Dillon, both Rostow brothers, Bobby Kennedy, Bill Moyers, and others. There was a quiet but implicit succession struggle underway subsurface for years, 
and it played a certain role in moves that were made and positions that were taken. In the end, of course, Rusk outlasted them all. Four, John mentions on page 100 that during the second alleged uh, Gulf, uh, Tonkin Gulf incident, August 4th, 1964, LBJ had to divide his time between Vietnam and Mississippi, that is, between Vietnam and civil rights. This double dilemma and its related White House scenarios should be extended and magnified. For the first critical months of escalation in 1965, Johnson regularly divided his working days between Vietnam in the morning and civil rights in the afternoon. This was his foreign policy domestic trade-off. Ever the Senate majority leader, LBJ thought that war escalation for the conservatives and civil rights progress for the liberals was the essential axis on which his presidency rested. The two preoccupations overlapped as he attempted to deal with nearly daily emergencies in both South Vietnam and in the American South. Vietnam and civil rights comprised an almost contrapuntal political saga as Johnson saw it during the explosive first six months of 1965. Five, in the running up stages before the 1966 election, the administration consciously shifted the public rationale for the Vietnam War. To counterbalance the war, there was to be a peace program hopefully built around arms control and negotiations with the Russians. Consequently, in preparation for the Glassboro Summit in June 1967, Kosygin and Moscow were left off the hook in the rationale for the Vietnam War. The rationale now centered on China alone. McNamara's missiles were hypothetically intended for Chinese targets. Rusk was speaking of a billion Chinese armed with nuclear weapons. But conceptually, the new peace policy toward Moscow fell apart even before the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia and stressing the Chinese threat only proved to be a counterproductive boomerang. It reinforced American policymakers in their fear of Chinese intervention in Vietnam, a fear that was more intense than it probably should have been, and they were hoist on their own petard. Let me quickly mention a few actual errors for correction in the second edition, although they, they fall in the hardly noteworthy category. Dean Rusk was not the president of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, page 34. He was the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. The separate listings for the two Arthur Schlesingers in the index should be conflated. All the references in the text are to the ubiquitous Arthur Jr., the Kennedy court historian. More ominously, Daniel Ellsberg is still alive, despite his premature death notice in the index. <laughs> Vice President Humphrey's personal effort in mid-February 1965 to sway Johnson from his imminent escalation in Vietnam is given, I think disappointedly, a single sentence on page 114. The episode merits much more attention. When John tells us later on page 215 that the McNamara Katzenbach critique in late 1967 posed to the president directly and for the first time the proposition that the Vietnam War could be lost in America, this is simply wrong. That proposition was posed in precisely those terms in a powerful personal memo from Humphrey to Johnson right after their joint inauguration. On February 17, 1965, Humphrey wrote LBJ about the politics of Vietnam. He warned that a sustained public support was already at risk and that support from democratic liberals, independents, and labor was already fragile, nearly three years before the Katzenbach memo. On page 543, speaking of intelligence agencies and their role in the Johnson administration and domestic spying, John tells us, quote, ordering a war against the American people was not a formula for success. Every, underlined by John, every element of the U.S. intelligence apparatus operated against Americans, unquote. This, of course, is simply untrue. The State Department's INR never was involved in domestic spying in the Johnson years, or as far as I know, in any other administration. This leads me finally to my most serious complaint, John's minor mistreatment, but overall non-treatment, of INR's Vietnam role. It won't surprise him that I've searched with special attention to see how he portrayed the role of government research and analysis on Vietnam, and I have to say that I'm perplexed. Two episodes are briefly recounted, and both are misleadingly described. <clears throat> on page 74, we read about the McNamara JCS complaint in 1963 that INR was allegedly, that INR was challenging MACV on Vietnamese body counts. True enough. According to the book, when confronted, Rusk promised McNamara that, quote, future INR papers on these subjects would be coordinated with the Pentagon, unquote. 
John omits adding here what he has accurately written elsewhere, that in practice this instruction turned out to mean exactly nothing. Again, on page 220, John reports straightforwardly that in November 1967, a staffer of Walt Rostow's Vietnam Information Group put together anecdotes for use at press briefings. Among them was a State Department intelligence analysis holding that General Jap sought to fight a protracted war with Jap, thus acknowledging that there had been little, if any, progress for the Viet Cong over the past year, unquote. A footnote refers to an NSC memo by Richard Moose and Bill Bundy, but the reader is left with the impression that this was an INR judgment. That simply can't be right. It is so contrary to what INR had repeatedly been saying for months that the quote either belongs to the Rostow Stafford's effort to be funny or to a policymaker's twisted embellishment of what INR was actually saying. What references there are to intelligence in this book almost exclusively dwell on covert operations at home and abroad. There are scattered mentions of a few intelligence personalities doing one thing or another, but there's practically nothing on intelligence analysis except for our imbroglio with the JCS in 63. INR's overall production on Vietnam from 63 to 69 remains unmentioned. This is particularly astonishing since John himself was instrumental in getting much of it declassified, and he's written extensively about it elsewhere. Uh, all of it is now available on the National Security Archive website. This book is supposed to be a comprehensive overview. It's almost as though having written at great length about intelligence elsewhere, John feels it's unnecessary to repeat anything here. There is only one reference buried in the index to his own praiseworthy article on INR from, 19, from 2004. That piece was entitled, quote, The Mouse That Roared, State Department Intelligence in the Vietnam War. It began as follows, quote, One of the untold stories of the Vietnam era, a tale that lies at the very heart of the nexus of Washington's war decisions and its appreciations of that conflict, is that of America's own diplomatic intelligence service. It is an account of sometimes breathtaking, sometimes frustrating efforts to speak truth to power in a situation of primary importance to the United States, its leaders, and its people. Twenty single-spaced pages later, John's article concludes with the words, Analyst for analyst and dollar for dollar, INR was possibly the most effective agency in the intelligence community. INR saved the CIA and other agencies from going even farther out on a limb than they climbed, and brought the community to a consensus view on the Indochina conflict's potential to escalate. It also helped limit the war by contributing to the reluctance of top officials to escalate too far. These were real contributions, and they deserve both attention and praise, unquote. Attention and praise, which is mystifyingly missing in this book. Thank you. Um, Larry? OK. <coughs> this is on. Is this, this is on, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, I'm going to take a little different uh, tact here. Uh, first, let me just say I'm delighted to be back at the Wilson Center. I spent a wonderful year here as a fellow, uh, probably uh, the most enjoyable year that I can recall uh, doing research for No Peace, No Honor, uh, Nixon, Kissinger, Betrayal in Vietnam. And it's also a privilege for me to uh, be here as a discussant uh, for a book that John's written because uh, my debt to him is greater than I can ever express for my own work and my own career. And uh, he's really been a go-to guy for me in a lot of things. It's not going to matter now, and I think some of the things I say, but I, my debt to him is, uh, is just great. Uh, uh, you know, I'm also in this situation where I do have a, uh, a blurb on the back of this book. Um, and let me tell you what that blurb says, and I hope that if you haven't read the book, you go out there and buy it, uh, because I really do think it's a terrific book. But my blurb says, uh, a terrific read, full of revelations and astute interpretations, and destined to become a classic. And in my brief time today, what I would like to do is try to just talk about three or four words in that blurb. One is some of the revelations, um, some of the uh, uh, astute interpretations, and... Uh, it's way too early to say uh, you know, whether it'll become a classic, but my bet is that uh, it will be. It'll be a, a, f a go-to book uh, for the next generation of scholars who are looking to understand uh, certain aspects of the, uh, of, of the Vietnam War. Um, as John said, uh, he's trying to write a unified field theory in this book. Uh, and uh, we are once again in his debt uh, because uh, this is a terrific book. Uh, it advances our understanding of why the United States fought in Vietnam, why the North won, and why the U.S. and its allies, South Vietnam, lost. 
Uh, and when I say that, I mean that the United States failed to achieve its rather limited political objectives, and the Republic of South Vietnam ceased to exist. These are both really important historical points that have rippled in discussion about Vietnam uh, at, for the last 35, five years. How did it happen? Why did it happen? And can John help us understand that a little better? Uh, and uh, uh, as I say, this is important because as John notes in this book, uh, a lot of discussion on Vietnam frequently gets sort of just carried away in refighting the war or in these sort of gen generic statements about the war. And I had to look no farther uh, than in what I consider to be one of the most vacuous and most uh, ideological charged and worthless reviews of this book that I've ever read, which was in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which ignored the massive evidence uh, and documentation that characterizes good history, uh, actually exemplary history, uh, in identifying what uh, John would say is, is um, essential uh, truth. And in that review, which I'm not, I'm not going to read, I do want to just say one thing, uh, which is that uh, the ideological argument that is often used for books like this uh, is that you discount the evidence, you discount the history, and you get down to the fact that Vietnam was a noble cause, that we were fighting for freedom. Uh, and as the author wrote, uh, that what John left, what, what John forgets, which he doesn't forget, which he puts in the book and is really actually quite clear about it, is that Americans fought and died for freedom just as they are doing in Iraq and Afghanistan today. And uh, uh, my point here as I begin my remarks is that the issue is not um, any longer, I don't believe, should it be whether Vietnam was a noble cause, uh, meaning that it ensured a separate, we sought to ensure a separate, autonomous, sovereign, uh, anti-communist state that could stand alone. Uh, uh, that, that, that's not really uh, the argument that we should be having, having today. That's, that's over. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it's almost as pr what President Obama said last night uh, uh, in, in a BBC interview, in which I understand he's probably saying today or, or tomorrow, which is that the United States cannot impose uh, its values on other countries, but the principles of democracy and the rule of law are universal. So to quote Barack Obama today, the danger, I think, is when the United States or any country thinks we can simply impose these values on the country with a different history and a different culture. Now, if you read this book, you'll find out that one of the essential components of this book, perhaps the overlying theme of this book, um, is that John helps us understand uh, that there are critical questions of the nature of, of the war that need to be uh, addressed, and he does so in these, in these chapters. And he concludes by noting that if you're looking for the big fault, and I'd be curious to know if he thinks I'm right on this, but if you're looking for the big fault, is that we fail to understand the nature of not only Vietnamese nationalism, but you know, Vietnamese history, Vietnamese culture, uh, and that this ignorance, uh, which uh, hurt us in Vietnam, is likely to continue to hurt us uh, in numerous interventions. Uh, and I want to return to that at the end of my remarks. I think that the book helps us to understand such critical questions uh, as why the United States chose to fight the way it did, how North Vietnam prevailed, the relationship of political objectives to military strategy, and the lessons that can be derived from public diplomacy and secret negotiation that made up the end game of Vietnam. Now, in the very short time I have, I want to touch on a few of these uh, key points. The first one is what I think is John's major point, that uh, understanding Vietnam and Vietnam history would have helped. Uh, and if we had understood that history, had we understood the nature of the Vietnamese Revolution, that envelope would not have narrowed. Indeed, there were options presidents could have pursued. And one of the interesting things in the book, I think, is the way John suggests where those options might have occurred. There's two or three places where I don't agree with him, and I'm going to raise those right now, but there really is food for thought, and I think for students of the war, it's food for thought. Uh, the first is, of course, that, okay, what does it mean to say understanding Vietnam would have helped or understanding the Vietnamese Revolution would have helped? Well, again, to quote Dan Ellsberg, who is alive, and I, I was going to make that point uh, as well. Uh, you took that line away from me, so I've got to just, uh, just now go with my option B. Uh, Dan made the following observation way back in 1972. There, was, there has never been an official 
uh, of Deputy Assistant Secretary rank or higher, including myself, who could have passed in office a midterm freshman exam in modern Vietnamese history if such a course existed in this country. Now, quite simply, we did not understand Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese nationalism. The biggest mistake made by critics of either this book or John's argument or even my own work often is that, well, you know, you can say we didn't understand Vietnamese nationalism, but look at the outcome. Look what happened. You know, look at the dark days of Vietnam and look at the gulags and look how all of those South Vietnamese, those allies were punished. Look at that. They really were, they weren't nationalists. They were, and you could just take the list from there, Stalinists, you know, murderers, just keep going and on, going on and on. My point here is to say, that that outcome misses the most fundamental point of the war, which is that outcome occurred because of the American intervention, because of the fact that 550,000 American troops were dispatched to a country the size of my home state of California, and basically America tried to impose its values, and that regime did turn to the, to, to, to the Soviets, did turn to the Chinese, did become something that it would not have become, I believe, in 1945, had this war been left, had this thing been left to the Vietnamese to settle for themselves. The outcome was horrendous. And what happened to the South Vietnamese, our al allies, was a horrible thing. And Vietnam went into, became a basket case between 1975 and 1987 or 88 before the Des Moines. And, and just right, and obviously is still, you know, suffering the consequences of that. But the fundamental fact is that it occurred because of the consequences of the American intervention. John just said in his observations, what would have happened had we just turned away? Well, the Vietnamese would have settled it uh, between themselves. And besides, as John astutely notes in this book, and as most of the people in this room are aware, we really never cared about the Vietnamese anyway when we intervened. They weren't important to us. Not losing South Vietnam was what was important. The Vietnamese, we didn't understand their history, we didn't understand their culture. It was what the role of the small country in this containment theory and the, dom and the significance of those dominoes uh, falling meant to decision makers uh, in, uh, in Washington. Uh, and uh, 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 in my recent book uh, on uh, Pham Soon An, A Perfect Spy, uh, this is what An, told, uh, An kept telling me over and over again. The one thing I, I learned from him uh, was this notion that we just fail to understand not only the, the, the nature of Vietnamese nationalism, but that, that uh, our own, uh, our, this would manifest itself later in, in some significant ways with our ally, which I'll return to at the, clo at, at the close. Uh, now, there is a lot uh, in here that's really important uh, about clo the closing of this envelope. Uh, and John touches on them in 1945. You know, one of the things I don't think he pays enough attention to is President Truman uh, and Secretary, writing to sec uh, the, the letter that Ho Chi Minh wrote in 1945. Uh, in one final grasp for American support, writing Truman and Secretary of State James Burns that the Philippines independent offered a model for emulation for the Viet Minh. This is a very important letter, I believe, and it gets not enough attention in this book. Uh, this is what Ho wrote to Truman. It is with this firm conviction that we requested the United States as guardians and champions of world justice to take a decisive step in support of our independence. What we ask has graciously been granted in the Philippines. Like the Philippines, our goal is full independence and full cooperation with the United States. That was an option, as John points out. There was a, win there was a window. But policymakers, as John does note, but I I'd like to expand on it, did not understand the dynamics of the 1945 revolution in Vietnam. They really didn't know whether it was a war for national liberation or a war to help Moscow and Peking increase their influence in Southeast Asia. They didn't know, and they really didn't do the rigorous analysis that was necessary. What did American policymakers know about the years preceding the Vietnamese Revolution from 1941 to 1945? Or for that matter, what was the level of understanding of the Vietnamese Communist Party or of the French colonial policy in Vietnam? Was there a capacity, even a willingness, to historically and culturally contextualize these events? as we might expect responsible decision makers to do who are going to be leading us into a war. None of this occurred. None of this occurred. And John's going through the documents demonstrates this uh, r uh, rather, uh, rather well. Uh, 
Uh, there was a missed opportunity at this early stage. I'm going to uh, move on to some other points right now about revelations and interpretations. Uh, one that I think is really open to question, and I'm not fully convinced, but it is, as, as I said on this, uh, on this uh, blurb, an astute interpretation, I'm not sure it's one I agree with, uh, is Ike's uh, uh, the things we do for friends, though. I mean, and uh, 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 is Ike's and uh, this, whole pr this whole notion of Eisenhower and DMBM Fu, I mean, not only does John begin this book, but he ends this book with this real emphasis on a reinterpretation of Eisenhower a re, uh, and Eisenhower's role uh, in DMBM Fu. Now, I was particularly interested in this because I am the a co-author of an award-winning book, uh, How Presidents Test Reality, which looked at DMBM Fu and credited and applauded Eisenhower for not intervening. That is, you know, he, he, he resisted the French pleas for sending troops. Uh, and he didn't send troops, and you know, and I quote extensively from Radford's uh, uh, warnings to him about, uh, you know, this would be a disaster uh, to to send troops to Vietnam. We couldn't possibly win. These would be a memo that would later resurface when George Ball uh, would make the same arguments uh, in 1965 uh, with John, uh, with with Lyndon uh, Johnson. But in in John's account, uh, it is Eisenhower's guilt. Uh, for feeling or res feeling responsible somehow for uh, this failure at Zm Bien Phu uh, that then led him to support uh, Zm uh, in this very important letter uh, that, he, that that he outlined and he 's got some evidence for that, uh, but not enough for me uh, maybe there 'll be more and i 'd like him to address this and I also disagree with him on the role of Lawton Collins during this period i 'm going to leave it Rufus Phillips is here. Um, he is uh, the author of a terrific new book also, Why, Why Vietnam Matters, and he knew Collins. He was there in that period. I know he wants to talk to John about that, so I'm going to just bypass that momentarily, but I do think that that Collins interpretation there is open to, uh, we should have a, a, a fair and rigorous debate about that, and, um, and I'd like to uh, I contribute to that after Rufus has his opportunity, or John has his opportunity to talk about it. Uh, Just a few minutes ago in his comments, uh, uh, Tom mentioned that uh, this missed opportunity of J John F. Kennedy, um, <coughs> John talks quite a bit about National Security <coughs> Action Memorandum 263, which does create this sort of allure of an option. Uh, but unless I missed it, uh, there was almost no discussion of, of, of LBJ's 273 and sort of, you know, what happened between 263 and 273 and, uh, and what would lead to that change and could John, you know, I would really like John to take a firm stand as to, well, would, do you really think Kennedy would have gotten this out or not? My reading of the book is that, well, we really can't tell, but if I had to take a guess, John would say that no, um, that, 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 that Kennedy 273 was not, 263 was not a document uh, that was, uh, as Oliver Sohn said, sort of some sort of guide uh, to withdraw to, from draw, to draw from Vietnam. I'd like to hear John's thoughts on that. Uh, I do differ with him a little bit, and I'm not surprised. We've had this discussion uh, before on the ZM coup. Uh, my own view is once you replace a government, it's yours. And I think that's where, the, that's where it narrowed. There were no more options after that. Once you, once you replace that government, you own it. You own the country. And we owned Vietnam after we got rid of ZM. I mean, and, you know, again, I know I've had this discussion with a lot of people. I understand the other point of view. But um, uh, in my time today, I just wanted to say that I think there were no options after that. Uh, you could argue that there were options, uh, but we owned the country um, uh, we, after, after we, we, we let ZM down, uh, go down the, down the tubes. And the real missed opportunity was well before that. It was well before that. Uh, I'm going to skip over the 1965 period because uh, uh, that's been discussed already. I want to turn to the negotiations uh, for a second. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, uh, and, and talk about a little about the Nixon administration. I mean, there's really no one better to talk about Nixon and Duck Hook uh, and sort of the madman theory and Nixon's taxes than John. I mean, he's really milked through these documents. He's gone through it. Uh, for me, I would have liked to see more of a discussion later in the book about the linkages between things that have preceded it. For example, I see a, a real linkage 
uh, between U.S. motives in Geneva and U.S. motives in the 1973 Paris negotiations, which is you could sign a piece of paper that was worthless, you knew it, and you could then tell your allies, ignore the calls for elections, ignore all the things that are, you know, politically important, and let's just hold on, you know, because uh, eventually we're going to get a break somewhere or we'll just have this indefinite, uh, indefinite period of stalemate. Uh, you know, in private, uh, we now know that Henry Kissinger uh, allowed, he had given up in the negotiations with Le Ducteau, he had given up on the issue of northern troops remaining, and Hanoi waited until 1972 when the balance of forces in the South was decidedly in their favor. And the Politburo then instructed To to concede on the point of two remaining in power because in Hanoi's eyes, President Tu was irrelevant. He was irrelevant because they had this document, they had this treaty, which they thought uh, would allow them to unify their country. Whereas Kissinger describes Hanoi's concessions as the one he had dreamed about for years. And this led John Negroponte, as we all know, to quip, yes, we bombed them into accepting our concessions. Uh, and John has a nice discussion of that, a really nice discussion of that. Uh, and uh, the declassified record shows that President Tu was encouraged not to hold elections until the northern troops went home, to use the political prisoners as hostage, even though Kissinger had promised Tu their release. Uh, and uh, he, was pr he, was, he, was, he was urged not to comply with almost all of the political aspects of the Paris, of the Paris Treaty. Tu was actually being asked to accomplish something Kissinger failed to achieve in three years of negotiation. Now, I want to conclude uh, these points by making the following uh, two or three observations, which is, uh, in Vietnam, a set of limited political objectives in a region of political instability proved elusive, not only during the escalation stage, but during, during the protracted disengagement process as well. And there are several lessons uh, to be learned from this several of which John discusses, and I just, as I discuss them here, I wanted just to let you know which those, those are. And I would like to get his opinion on a few of them as well. I'd like to know, for example, something he doesn't discuss, he hints at, was, was the deal negotiated in 1973 available in 1969? Why did the United States not try to secure more formal guarantees for President II and sanctions against land grabbing and troop movement? Did President Nixon's advisors believe that continued American funding would guarantee a free and independent South Vietnam, and therefore no additional treaty provisions were necessary. What happened to the residual force that Kissinger had promised the South Vietnamese but disappeared? There was no tail left behind. What happened to it? Is there any documentation that we can learn from in this history that would tell us uh, what happened to that uh, tail that had been promised uh, to uh, President uh, uh, Tu? Uh, did Nixon or Kissinger envision conditions under which the United States could ever re-enter the, the Vietnam conflict? Did either of these principles anticipate the return of U.S. air power as an instrument for maintaining the peace? On these issues, I don't see, a, there's not a lot of discussion. Prob uh, the book's already 700 pages. It'd have to be 1,700 pages, perhaps, to include all, all of this. Um, how did President Nixon expect to sell politically, or could he have ever sold politically, a return of any aspect of the war, or was he really just done with this whole thing? Uh, finally, one thing I do notice in the book, um, and it would be helpful to me to know, is there has been uh, an extraordinary release of, of new tapes uh, and new materials uh, uh, that John has been at the forefront of. And I would like to know, uh, uh, more clearly than I think the book lets me know, uh, how these tapes, which I refer to, and as many of us do, as the gifts that keep giving, um, uh, which is sort of how have these helped us to really come to understand why Vietnam was an un, un, why it was an, un, an unwinnable war. Which brings me uh, to my uh, final point, which is I share John's conclusion that Vietnam was an unwinnable war. And in the beginning of his book, he makes uh, quite a bit of, of places quite a bit of emphasis on the fact that he's going to focus on the South Vietnamese ally. And that he does a really good job throughout this book discussing not only the South Vietnamese ally politically, but also with respect to Arvin. 
Uh, but there is something I would like to add here, something that he uh, that may not be as gentle as he places in in his book, um, uh, which is uh, uh, this is what Pham Soon An told, told Robert Chaplin in 1967 about the United States support for the uh, uh, for the two regime, and I think it comes to the heart of almost everything that John is talking about about what happened in Vietnam after these envelopes or these opportunities. Uh, narrowed, and these come directly from Chaplin, who was the Far East correspondent for the New Yorker and spent quite a bit of time in Vietnam. These come from his reporter's notebooks uh, that are located in the, Wis the Wisconsin Historical Society's uh, archives on the campus of the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, and I'm just going to read it very briefly, which is uh, uh, he compares uh, on Pham Soon An compares President to to a, an opium addicted circus monkey, which is that as long as you keep giving that monkey the opium, it'll keep performing the tricks and doing whatever you want because it wants the opium. Well, South Vietnam wanted the opium too. They wanted the money, the roads, the schools. But here came the fundamental mistake that the United States made, according to Pham Soon An, who also obviously was the you know the, the, the communist high you know most successful and most heralded spy uh, at uh, you know uh, during the war, uh, and this is what An tells Chaplin, uh, you see on President Two, we made him so, and if we let him go, he'll sink. Lots of Chinese and Saigonese raise monkeys, feed them opium, good food, do tricks, put on fancy hats. It's a circus. But when the owner turns his back for three minutes, the monkey will revert to his basic nature and eat excrement, just like two. So if we are delaying our support for five minutes, Arvin gets swallowed up. We are creating a monkey climate here in South Vietnam. We, and then he goes on, on goes on and tells Chaplin, blood and dollars have been spent here, but what have we done it to the Vietnamese in Saigon? Most Americans are in contact only with the monkeys and we will soon withdraw anyway. We know only the monkeys. When we came, we, used, we made use of the Viets trained by the French, the Mandarin crowd, and we made the new generals, gave them dollars, etc., and we made them all monkeys and didn't know how to use them. There is no Vietnamese document. There is no Viet doctrine, no U.S. doctrine either. We build school buildings, but we have no teachers. Build roads and new canals, but the Viets don't know how to use them. So the Americans can't put their brains in our hats, and that's been proven. There's no real leadership training here in Vietnam. And then An predicted that the United States would leave Vietnam a dry corpse. This book helps us understand why that happened, and it makes it all the more tragic as we think about the context of the war. Uh, and thanks to John's research, it's just one more uh, block in our understanding. Those are my comments. Thanks. Well, thank you all. Um, <clears throat> we still have quite a little bit of time for some Q&A, so please wait for the microphone and identify Can yourself. Can I uh, say a few things first? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, first, let me say, uh, Tom, my profoundest apologies. I still believe today everything that I said before about INR, and INR was a fabulous intelligence organization, and I am probably guilty here of pulling the punch on intelligence activities in the Vietnam War because I have long had it in the back of my head to write a book that was just about the intelligence of Vietnam. So I was been, I've been uh, holding on to material much more than I should have. Um, a couple of Larry's points, I can't respond to all of them, but I should say a couple of things. Um, most particularly, Dien Bien Phu and Radford, because that's going to feed into this conversation we're going to have over here. Um, the, the efforts of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Arthur Radford, at the time of Dien Bien Phu, uh, should not be interpreted as uh, efforts of someone who is attempting to avoid an American intervention in this situation in Southeast Asia. It is true uh, 
in fact, as Larry said, that Radford wrote a memo which was given to the president that said that Southeast Asia is devoid, and he used that word, if I recall correctly, devoid of significant strategic objectives that would be worth an American commitment. And the mystery about Arthur Radford is that uh, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who held that point of view about the strategic importance of Southeast Asia could simultaneously needle the President of the United States to go ahead with a military intervention that would have put the American forces uh, that were in Vietnam in the 1960s there 10 years earlier without any of the preparation that, that uh, had occurred by the later phase. But uh, I think this is an example of the way that that whole crisis really, uh, I called it DNA, it really influenced everything, and not just Americans. We have Vietnamese generals who talk about how uh, their forces executed uh, an aerial Dien Bien Phu by shooting down B-52 bombers. We have American generals who are saying that the battle they're fighting at Khe San isn't going to be a Dien Bien Phu. We have Vietnamese generals again saying that the fight that they're going to carry out at Tet uh, is going to be like Dien Bien Phu but different from Dien Bien Phu. And we have a variety of figures on all sides uh, of the Vietnam War citing this analogy, using it as a, 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 a piece of their argumentation in advocating particular strategies or maneuvers, uh, making analogies to the results of Dien Bien Phu to justify what they achieved in given combat situations. And we have the figures much as I said about the Vietnamese who observed the Americans in the Saigon crisis of 55 and how that affected leverage, we have the figures, the American presidents who sat and watched Dien Bien Phu happen in front of them and felt whatever they felt about Dien Bien Phu that happened, the military officers who saw it on both sides, uh, on the Vietnamese side as well. Um, uh, Tom Hughes mentioned, in fact, uh, and this is very true, that Eisenhower consistently throughout this whole period of the 1960s took this interventionist uh, in every time that uh, he was asked to help John Kennedy or Lyndon Johnson with advice, with political support, and so on. Uh, it all came back to this idea that he had not been forceful enough at that moment in 1954. So I don't think you can, I, I don't think that uh, uh, the role of Dien Bien Phu in all the rest of this should be minimized. And perhaps I wasn't clear enough about stating it. Uh, I'll try that again some other place. Um, John, can, can I stop you there? Because there's a ton of hands up and yeah, you know, there we have are. like 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Um, just right over there. Yeah. Right over, yeah. <laughs> Uh, my name is Rufus Phillips, and uh, I am probably the only living American who was actually on the scene during the, uh, the war in Saigon. I was there from August 1954 until uh, the end of 1956. And uh, I worked for one of the characters in John's book named Edward G. Lansdale. Uh, I was very close to the Vietnamese Army, and uh, in fact, I was so close that at one point, uh, when I was the only American accompanying uh, the Vietnamese Army into the occupation of the zones that are being evacuated north by the uh, Viet Minh, the French complained and said that, well, the, the Vietnamese were saying, we don't want any foreigners to go with us. And they pointed to me and said, well, he's a foreigner. And they, the Vietnamese said, no, he's our friend. And that kind of contact with the Vietnamese opened a lot of floodgates of information. In other words, people really let their hair down and, and, and let you know what they thought. In terms of, uh, of uh, Collins and Collins' role, uh, 
I want to cite two incidents which I'm, really, I think, I'm, describe... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I want to have to stop. Yeah. If you have a question, um, okay. please do the question, but there, there are lots of people who actually have questions as well, so we'll have an opportunity for you to, to talk to John at, at, at the end of this. Well, if this, you have is, some this comments. is really important, because if you think Collins knew what he was doing, then I'd like John to answer uh, this question. If that was so, why was it that... Uh, a fellow in the USIS who was a press secretary, Howard Simpson, went out and interviewed uh, Bivian's uh, political advisor. And while he was there, uh, a French dispatch writer grew up with a dispatch. A French officer comes out of the communication shed. Uh, Simpson goes back and reports to, to the embassy. And they wouldn't listen to him. They said, no, it can't be true. And what I'm trying to say is that Collins was misled by the French, and he really adopted the French point of view. And I think you need to tell both sides of that story, John. Uh, yeah, just right back there. Okay, okay. next, next one. Uh, Mr. Proudis, um I'm, I'm interested in the uh, the documents, uh, recent, most recently declassified documents, if there are any, you know, smoking guns um, that have recently come out that, you know, would ex would say, would, would answer people like Anthony Kordsman, who wrote a piece in the Washington Post saying that we won the Vietnam War in 1973. And that you know the Viet Cong had been defeated and 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 all this. I mean, where are the documents that that say that the policymakers saying we can't win? I mean, what wasn't that? Isn't that really what the documentation should show? That uh, they never believed that that we could win. It was not meant to be be won. I, I just wondered if you have some specific documents, recently declassified documents. Just go ahead and address those two, and then we'll take more. Okay, uh, let me take that last one first. Um, the documents that say we won the war in 1973 don't exist because we didn't win the war in 1973. And you're quite right to suppose that uh, um, you know that that's a, a problem finding that kind of a smoking gun. The fact of the matter is that. Uh, at the moment that the Paris Peace Accord was signed in January 1973, the North Vietnamese Army was in South Vietnam in positions that it had assumed during 1972, during the fighting of that year, that a focused South Vietnamese offensive had been unable to drive it back into those so-called uh, base areas. Um, and that... Uh, the result was a stalemate in South Vietnamese military, which was exhausted and not capable of further offensive action, versus a North Vietnamese military that was also exhausted, but uh, was in position and uh, able to move ahead again. Uh, so, uh, and I do cite, actually, in this book, uh, the very last report of the U.S. military attache in Saigon in April 1975, uh, which reviews the whole military situation in, of so-called Vietnamization, is reporting on the progress of the Vietnamese military, and actually reports in almost the exact same terms as you will find in the uh, attache reports on Vietnamization of 1972 and 1970 and 1969 and earlier periods of time. In other words, all those years of American aid and all those years of U.S. training had not in fact solved South Vietnam's military problems. Um, on the situation about uh, General Collins, the uh, there is no doubt that among the machinations that were going on in Saigon at that time in 1955 were French machinations, and the French were definitely tied in with the political military sex. And there's also, I think uh, Rufus Phillips is quite right to point out that there was... Uh, 
uh, a degree of cooperation, you might even call it collaboration, between the French potentate at that time was General uh, uh, Elie, Paul Elie, who had been actually the French chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, their Joint Chiefs at the time of Dien Bien Phu, just to throw that in again. Um, Paul Elie and Collins on the American side, a degree of cooperation between those two. Uh, however, the, uh, s the situation with uh, ZM wasn't a situation of uh, choosing this set of Americans over this set of French over some other subset of Vietnamese nationalists. The situation for uh, Ziem was choosing one set of Vietnamese upon which to focus his power, and that was the same set, in fact, that he had had in place from the beginning and which Americans had already already understood was problematical. It was the CIA, talking about intelligence analysis, as early as August of 1954 that pointed out that ZM conducting government as a, uh, a, 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 a tightly focused clique operation was going to be a political problem. So you fast forward a year now to the spring of 1955, the situation in Saigon is precisely the same, bad enough that the Sachs, who had been prepared to be bought off by ZM, because one of the other things that uh, uh, ZM was doing, and had been doing, was to take over the former French secret payments to the Sachs as a device for buying their loyalty to him instead. Um, Despite that, the sex were, were ready to revolt against CM, and that's, the fa in fact, the point of uh, conflagration where that crisis erupted was when, ev it, when it became impossible for CM to buy them off himself. Um, now, uh, General Collins, and generals don't become generals in the U.S. Army except by having strong views and uh, being not responsive a lot of times to advice that people give them. General Collins may or may not have been correct in his view about the nature of Mo Din Ziem and the nature of Ziem's power, but it was true from the standpoint of U.S. policy that moving ahead with ZM was an error. And uh, despite the fact that the people who collaborated to uh, undermine what Collins was trying to accomplish here uh, had the best of intentions in terms of accomplishing a new dynamic Vietnamese society, they, their possibilities for actually succeeding with that enterprise rose and, fall, rose and fell with Ngo Dinh Ziem, who we see was a very thin reed on which to hang that uh, hat. So uh, what we had here was a situation where we gave up our primary means of influencing situation in return for a marginal chance at uh, advancing the Vietnamese uh, uh, political polity. All right. Let me just take two questions on this side. Mel Leffler first, and then right over there. John, I really admire uh, your effort to take on a book about the uh, entire war in Vietnam. My question has to do with the way you deal with the uh, origins of the American uh, commitment under Truman and even more so as you focus on right now under Eisenhower. It seems to me that some of the um, best books that deal with the, the origins of American embroilment in Vietnam and Indochina have focused on uh, the imperatives of Japanese reconstruction and rehabilitation. Uh, I have in mind here the books by William Schoenberger and Andy Rotter. Michael Schaller, William Borden, all of which say that uh, what was decisive or what was extremely important 
uh, for American policymakers, and particularly for Dwight D. Eisenhower, was that he had an understanding of the political economy uh, of Japanese rehabilitation and assumed, as did many of the economic experts in the late 40s and early 50s, um, that uh, Japan could not be rehabilitated without markets and raw materials in, in Indochina and Southeast Asia. And this had a lot to do uh, with, the, uh, w with America's initial uh, commitments there. Yet I noticed in your index you have one entry, one page, that, in which you talk about Japan and nothing about this whole context of the political economy of Japanese rehabilitation. I was wondering um, whether you don't think this is important or whether you decided simply uh, for the sake of brevity to omit this or do you think there are other more important factors? Uh, we'll do Rusty. Um, like everybody else, I'm really incredibly impressed by the work that you've written and, it's, and I think it will be invaluable for scholars for as long as one can imagine people are writing about this. Um, I actually want to go to the other end of where your narrative is, which is the Nixon uh, period, and actually ask you to clarify some of what you said in a very compressed way at the beginning of your talk, which is, um, number one, that you're dealing with this narrowing envelope or shrinking envelope um, that's developing all the way through and which presumably extends into the Nixon administration. I'd actually like you to clarify what you meant by that. Then you also said um, that Nixon in some sense tried to break out of that, and you talk about Nixon's shock. Um, and I guess I'd like you to clarify that also. In what sense you think Nixon was trying to break out um, of the constraints of that time? And then I guess a third thing is, has to do with not what you said today, but what's in your book, which is that I think that the sections on the Nixon administration emphasize very heavily his personal role and to some degree um, sort of see him as operating against everybody else in his administration. I mean, that's more of an overall impression that one gets from reading it. Uh, maybe that's not your intention, but I'm wondering if you would talk about that. In other words, what the relationship is between Nixon and Kissinger on the one hand um, and the rest of the federal bureaucracy. And you can do that, I assume, in 30 seconds, right? <laughs> maybe about 15, actually. Um, John, go go right ahead. And after this, uh, there'll be plenty of time and some uh, hors d'oeuvres and, and uh, some wine outside, as well as books for sale. So please stick around, and, and John will be able to answer any additional questions you might have. But go ahead and, and, and touch. Okay. Uh, the whole question of uh, economic causality is more important from the Japanese standpoint than it is from the Vietnamese standpoint. If you look at the U.S. government uh, documentation, for example, in the middle of the Dien Bien Phu crisis, uh, the State Department uh, assembles at uh, Eisenhower's uh, request a massive, uh, basically, interest study, you know, um, and that study contains nothing about uh, the economic importance of Southeast Asian markets, uh, Indo-Chinese specifically, uh, and so on. Eisenhower mentions at one press conference these economic considerations. In fact, it's the same press conference where he uh, coined the phrase about the dominoes. Um, and that's the only reference to economic interests that occurs in the U.S. government throughout this interval of time. Uh, our impression as historians that these markets were that important uh, is actually true. The Japanese, Japan in fact uh, developed a very active trade with what became the Democratic Republic of North Vietnam. It was North Vietnam's uh, leading trade partner after the United Kingdom after 1954. And it was a, Japan was also an active trading partner with South Vietnam as well. But as that reflects, but that is not reflected in U.S. government policy. Uh, now just quickly to Nixon and Kissinger and uh, the envelope. Um, my general analysis is that uh, by 1968, 
the policy envelope had narrowed to such a degree that no American political figure who wanted to be president of the United States could be elected on a platform of pursuing war in Vietnam. Thus, you had an election in 1968 that, that pitted various candidates who, in one form or another, were promising voters that they were going to settle the war. Nixon uh, tried to break out, and I make this argument, by means of uh, gaining political space, and he tried to gain political space by making Americans think that he was doing what he promised, th thus uh, withdrawals of U.S. forces from Vietnam, while taking the military measures that he could take that would go uh, smite the enemy and knock them out, thus the idea for Duck Hook, thus the idea for the Cambodian invasion, the Laotian invasion, uh, and so on. Um, Nixon and Kissinger, uh, uh, uncomfortable relationship. They were uh, simultaneously cooperators and enemies. Uh, the whole question of who got the credit for what, when, and how was uh, of inordinate importance to both individuals, and that created problems within them from the get-go. It was better at the beginning when uh, there was a, a, an effort to make, conduct a more systematic administrative process. Right At the very beginning of the Nixon administration, they actually had an exercise at creating a policy and uh, uh, staffing it through the bureaucracy and uh, deliberating, it on, deliberating on it at the National Security Council in order to achieve a so-called National Security Decision Memorandum. But, um, <coughs> excuse me, the... Uh, uh, effect of that was swept away almost instantly by the evolution of events. And once they began to respond to events, they continued to do that so that you had this kind of day-to-day -day operation in which their particular maneuvers and the details of their particular maneuvers began to dominate uh, what they were doing. Great. Uh, thank you all. Join me in a uh, round of applause for the panel. And uh, please stick around. Join us outside for uh, uh, an opportunity to much. talk to the panelists and uh, first copy of the book. Yeah, yeah.